and we're here at the Atlanta History Center on November 28, 2007 to interview Mr. Alex Gay, uh, a, a, who served in World War II uh, for the Veterans Oral History Program. Uh, Mr. Gay, can you uh, give us your address, please? It's 2678 Regency Drive West, Tucker, Georgia. Okay, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your life before you uh, began your service? Uh, yes, I was born on May the 4th, 1919 in Scottsboro, Alabama. And I went to high school at Jackson County High School in Scottsboro and graduated there in 1937. I then went to college at the University of Alabama and I spent three years at, at uh, college and I was interested in aviation and my sophomore year while attending the University of Alabama the US government offered a, a program of free private training lessons for a private license which I was lucky enough to be one of those. I got interested in aviation <coughs> and uh, after three years of uh, in the at the University of Alabama. Uh, several of my friends who had gone through this uh, training program with the government, well, we decided that we would sign up with the Army Air Corps. So that, uh, in 1940, uh, I signed up after three years of college. Uh, at that time, you had to have two years of college to qualify for the aviation cadet. So, as an aviation cadet, I was first assigned to uh, <clears throat> uh, to East St. Louis at a uh, primary training school. I was in uh, uh, my notes. I think that was in <clears throat> that was in 1940. Uh, and I went through training at East at. Uh, at uh, Scott, I uh, left no, one Scott. It was in uh, East St. Louis, a, tri a primary training school. And from there, I, uh, I graduated and was transferred to Maxwell Air Force Base for, for what they call basic training. Now, I'd like to stop here and, and talk a little bit about the training command. Can you put it on hold for a minute? Let me get my breath. <clears throat> After finishing the primary training at, at, uh, at East St. Louis, I was transferred to Maxwell Air Force Base, which was opening a new training school. I'd like to explain a little bit about training and a background at that time. Uh, prior to 1940, there were only two training, sco two, uh, training schools that the Army had. They were both in San Antonio. One was located at uh, Randolph, the other one is at Kelly. One was a, what they call basic training, and, it, and uh, at Kelly you got your, your second lieutenant and your wing. But that was the only training going on during that time, and it's, uh, if you study history, the military army at that time had very few pilots. It's amazing to know in 1942 we had thousands of B-24s over, over Europe flying. Well, basically, my, my experience was in training command because after graduating from Maxwell in BT-13, I was selected to go to, to a instructor training school for the BT-13. I was transferred over to Montgomery, uh, to, uh, uh, East Montgomery into an instructor school. And after uh, while there, I would like to relate a little bit about experiences of the BT-13. Can, can you tell us what a BT-13 is? Uh, I beg your pardon. What is a BT-13? BT-13 was a, uh, a single engine aircraft that uh, uh, was new and it was being built, I think it was being built in Canada. And it was fairly, it was a new aircraft. And during our training, uh, when we were in advanced training, we lost several student pilots 
uh, they were going in to spin, that, that was part of the instructions, how to recover from spin, and they were spinning right into the ground and killing themselves. So this was a problem that was sp uh, spasmodically happening. During uh, uh, the first class to go to Maxwell was what was called 41A. I was in class 41B at Maxwell. And uh, the, at that point, the government was anticipating that we were going to get into war. In fact, they had already made arrangements with, with uh, Great Britain that we would start training their students. This was in 1940. Um, so anyway, I became an instructor at, uh, at Montgomery uh, Field there in Montgomery, went through a training period there, and we were using the BT-13s, single-engine aircraft, stationary gear, didn't have a retractable gear. And it was a fairly new airplane, and then during our, uh, about half of our class were, were assigned to Montgomery to become instructors. And we then were flying each other, one uh, as an instructor, we were learning the, the student aspect so therefore, we were, we were the student and the pilot in the instructor training school. During that period, one of my classmates was up flying one day, and uh, they, uh, they had to bail out because they were demonstrating the spin. And as it turned out, later we found out, uh, one of the pilots, uh, both of them uh, bailed out, but one of them went through the prop and cut his legs off, so he died. But the other one lived to tell about it. But when he got on the ground, we found that there was a problem with the PT-13. It had a, uh, a uh, rudder lock, which was nothing but a spool back where the rudder hit the spool. Well, it so happened that once we knew what was happening, we went uh, went up and down the line pushing rudders, and we found one and found the problem. And there's nothing in the world but a improper uh, a little uh, rudder stop, which was corrected and never had any more problems with that. So that problem was solved, but we had lost several students, and, uh, and, and of course one of my classmates was, was killed. And we learned that. So then I was transferred from there uh, and, uh, to uh, uh, Cochrane Air Force Base in Macon, Georgia. Now this was uh, uh, this was in July 1940. Uh, no, 41. Let me get to my notes. Okay. So on May the 30th, 1941, I was transferred to Cochrane Field in Macon, Georgia. I had a total time of 293 hours. And uh, we were instructing uh, uh, some American students and as well as some uh, uh, British cadets. British cadets at this time, we were already not even in war, but we were helping them in their war effort by training their pilots. Uh, as a personal interest, it turned out that I was dating a girl in, Mac in Lewisville, Georgia, and one of the, not my student, but, but a British student was, was dating her too. <laughs> but I went out because he got moved back to England. That's the point of, uh, at, at uh, Macon. So uh, my ex uh, I was in the training command, and they, we were tra uh, being trans uh, promoted fairly rapidly. And I was promoted to a first lieutenant after about a year, and there at uh, at, at, at Cochran uh, Field in Macon, and I was transferred uh, on uh, to Bainbridge, Georgia, on seven slash twenty eight forty two. So now this is in forty two. This is still before the war. Uh, uh, is it? No, no, that's actually Yeah, just the, uh, 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 well, uh, back up a little bit. While I was at, at while I was at Cochrane Field, the war broke out, and uh, you can imagine 
a, a military service with BT-13 going on alert. <laughs> we were all ordered back to the base and get our 45s out. I don't know who we were going to fire. Well, but anyway, it was... It where, where were you? What were you doing at the time you well, found out? Well, at the time, time I, was, I was dating a girl in, in uh, Columbus, Georgia, and I was at a show, and they announced it to show. Okay. And it said, and it announced that all military report back to the base immediately. So I had to go back to to uh, to, to uh, 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 Cochran Field. So that that was the entering the war, but uh, I was instructing, still instructing. So in seven twenty eight forty two, I was transferred to Bainbridge, Georgia as a first lieutenant and uh, was in instructing uh, American students down there. I don't, I don't think we were training the uh, British at that time. Uh, but at the beginning of World War, uh, at the wartime, the military, the Army Air Corps had very, very few pilots. Can you imagine in 1942 having a thousand B-24s over Germany? And the training that goes into this, and I was part of the training, mm -hmm. and basically that's where I lived uh, during World War II was training pilots, and I've been training pilots all my career, and uh, in fact uh, I might break in now and say that uh, everywhere I went, I was made an instructor pilot, and I flew. Uh, the following aircraft was instructors, the BT-13, which I've discussed, the B-24, which I'm going to get into in a minute, the B-29, the uh, B-17, the B-25, the C-54, AT-6s, C-47, C-45, C-133s, C-124s. So I, actually I've been uh, service oriented all my 28 years of service. but. Here we are now uh, down at Bainbridge, and uh, we are, uh, we're training pilots out the kazoo by this time. The, uh, the Army Air Corps had, uh, beginning in 1940, had established three, uh, two additional training commands in addition to the one that was located in, uh, in Randolph and, and uh, Kelly Field. They now had two other training commands, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. And I was, of course, on the East Coast, and I was in what they call the Eastern Air Training Command. And they were building an airstrip like crazy. They built one down in Bainbridge, Georgia, and I went down there and I became a captain while I was at Bainbridge. And uh, time went on and we were instructing the, the basic Basic, I was a basic trainer, not advanced trainer, basic trainer, which was single engine. The, uh, later on, the twin engine became the advanced people, and we're going into twin engine. But I was still in, in a single engine, but by, uh, by this time, uh, I thought I was going to combat, and I got orders to move to uh, Smyrna Air Force with, in Tennessee for four engine training. And that was in uh, March the 28th, 1943. And uh, when I arri arrived there in 1943, they had both uh, the B-17 and the B-24s training there, and we were training. They were training pilots uh, who had who had we had trained, and they finally got up to four engine. And it's a uh, these poor boys didn't have too many, too many hours. At that time, uh, at that time when I went to Smyrna, I had 1,164 hours. Well, these boys were coming out of flying school, uh, basic uh, advanced flying school, with around 300 hours. Then they put them into four-engine training there at, uh, at these locations they opened up, give them another two thousand, and then put them in a B-24, B-29 which was coming on the production line. It, it, it should be recognized that prior to 1940, all these, uh, the B-17, B-24s, were on the, on, the, uh, on, the board, on the planning board. 
they really didn't start producing them until about 1940, I don't know exactly, but in that area. And how the government at that time, uh, I should say something about the government at that time, everybody in the United States was behind the war effort. There was no quabbling about who, uh, whether or not we should have been in the war. Everybody was behind it, as including the women who <laughs> went to work uh, on building airplanes, and, and the whole government was behind our effort. And that uh, uh, broke off. It's made a good book on that. Well, let's get back to my my training. So I thought I was going to off way to combat. So I had quite a bit of hours when I got there. The first day they put me in a, a B-24 and I flew it. The second day they put me in a B-17 and I flew it. The third day they put me back in a B-24 uh, as a student. I was a student and the, the time there for student was 78 hours. You would get 78 hours and you get qualified in the airplane and then you go and get your crew. Well, on the second mission, before I even completed the 70 hours training, I was told I was a limited instructor. <laughs> and I said, which aircraft? And they said, the B-24. I said, okay, fine, that's a good aircraft. And um, so I, I'd like to, uh, at this point, uh, talk about the training there. Of course, I continued my training and got my 78 hours and became a fully qualified instructor. But as a, until that time, I was a, what they call a limited instructor. I would do all the landings, and the students uh, would only do air work. So I had students, I'd treat, te teach them formation and uh, uh, instrument training and this type, and I would always do the, the landing. Uh, and that was helping that force because everything was under expansion. And uh, at the end of that, uh, in the end of that tour, I was uh, transferred to Maxwell Field to, to a B-24. <laughs> now that where I had been trained in the BT-13s, we now had B-20. They now had opened up a B-24 tra transitional training school. So I went back to Maxwell, and uh, I'd like to back up uh, right before leaving the training uh, in the B-24s. Smyrna. I, I want to point out the, the flying time and what was going on during World War II in the training command. On uh, one month, the month of May of 1944, 45, uh, the one month of, we flew, I flew every day of, except for three days. And I had that, that month, I had 300 I flew 349, 349 hours and 65 landings. That was teaching students to fly the B-24. So now I'm transferred down to Maxwell, back to Maxwell Field to instruct in B-24. Of course, just by the time I got down there, I was a squadron commander, and I had uh, uh, other. Uh, instructors assigned to me who had been through the training school. So that was in, um, in 7 1943 to Maxwell. Uh, so uh, training uh, uh, the B-24s at Maxwell, as time went on, uh, they brought in B-29s into uh, to Maxwell because they had to train the pilots to fly the B-29. Well, the first, the very new B-29s that we received uh, at Maxwell, uh, because of my, I say, I was then transferred from the B-24 to the B-29 as an instructor. So uh, I continued uh, at Maxwell flying the B-29 and instructing other pilots how to fly. I was a squadron commander and uh, Anyway, uh, the war ended in 1946. Uh, before going to the 46 period, I would like to say this about the B-29. When they first uh, came out of production, they had a lot of trouble with the airplane's over uh, engines overheating, 
and uh, we were, they were catching on fire and we were losing quite a number throughout the world, but by this time they had some overseas. And we had these, probably the earlier versions of the B-29, and uh, to get that airplane off the ground, by the time you would taxi out to the takeoff position, your cylinder head was above limits, so you couldn't go. So what you did was, you asked the tire to let you taxi around real fast, and then come up on the runway and, and say, are we ready now, let us go, and so we'd take off. Well, we'd get airborne, and we didn't have to practice, I didn't have to teach uh, engine failure, because immediately you'd have to pull an engine back on the student, or the, whoever was flying the airplane, usually the student was in the left seat, and I was in the right seat. And you would pull one engine off and let it cool off and push it back in and let them be hot and you would push it back. Anyway, they had problems with that airplane, uh, initially airplanes, and we, we were having trouble with them. And the government, uh, working together, realized they had a deep problem and the engines were built by Wright. And so they asked Pratt and Whitney who was building the airplane, the engine for the B-17, what was wrong, and Pratt and Whitney told them. And it was nothing to worry about but lubricating the connecting rods on the engine. And this was done throughout the system. Of course, we continued to use the old aircraft till they fell apart. Well, anyway, to finish up the B-29 after the war was over in 46, uh, I was still at Maxwell, and uh, I was eligible to get out in uh, December of 46. I had plenty of points to get out. At the same time, I was offered a regular commission instead of, by this time I was a major. And uh, I, I was offered a commission, uh, I could apply for a commission in regular service, which I did. I said, well, if I get that, I'll stay in. If I don't, I'll get out. <laughs> and I probably would have gone to the airlines in a lot of my but he did mm -hmm. with the airline. So I got out, uh, I, I was able, to, I did receive a regular commission, and I flew one of the last B-29s out of Maxwell Field out to the boonies. And on the way out, I lost the engine on it. Got there, I told him, I got an engine out, what do you want to do with it? I said, put it in the boonies. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that, that takes me now through World War World War II, and I was a major. So, I received a regular commission as a first lieutenant in the, in the regular army, but I was a major in reserve. So, uh, this, uh, I, I then was offered at that time, because I hadn't, didn't have a degree, the government, because I would uh, a officer in the regular service, they wanted me to have a, a uh, degree. So they said, well, we'll authorize two more years to go back and get your degree. Well, I went back to the University of Alabama at government expense and lived in the VA, the VA home there that they had set up for the VA. And I knew all of, a lot of the VA people. And uh, I finished my degree with one year. I didn't need the two years. and. Then I received order order to to report to Guam, uh, in the uh, Guam uh, in the uh, Marianas. I, I mean, in, in the Mariana in, Islands. In, in Mariana Islands in the Pacific. So uh, at that time, of course, uh, the military people were all getting out and leaving the service, and uh, the. Uh, where I was, was assigned was uh, at the, uh, a materiel command. Uh, it was a service command serving the materials in the Pacific. In other words, from Guam, they serviced uh, Japan, uh, Yokonawa, uh, Saigon, and so forth. And uh, I became operations officer there, and I had a B-17, which I was qualified in. <laughs> and became the uh, uh, base operations officer. Well, uh, I had, uh, at that time, I had, uh, well, I had Boku hours, and they then put me 
in command of a DC-4 outfit. They had three squadrons of B-20, uh, B-20, uh, B, B, C-54. They had uh, three squadrons of C-54, which was supporting these islands and uh, throughout the Pacific. Can, can you tell us what a C-54 was? What kind a of a C-54 was a was a DC-4. It was a four-engine uh, aircraft, not pressurized uh, like the B-29. It was. Uh, you operated it uh, in the lower atmospheres and below. Okay. Uh, if you went up, you had to have oxygen. So we had to fly the B-20, B-20, the C-54. <laughs> the C-54 was a four-engine DC-4, the Douglas four-engine okay. that was now being used by the civilians as a, as a, a personnel carrier. And uh, we carried everything from nuts and bolts to engines to whatever to support these units. Well, along comes, during this time, along comes, we had three squadrons there, uh, about uh, 16 uh, C-54s in each squadron, and I had this one squadron of them. And uh, along comes Berlin Airlift. Well, they used the C-54 in the Berlin Airlift, and they had taken all the 54s from everywhere, including one of our squadrons there at Guam. Uh, unlucky for me, or lucky for me, who knows, uh, they didn't take my squadron. So I had, I was left as one of the two squadrons on Guam to finish out my tour on Guam with the C-54 while they went over and got merits and all this uh, beauty bit on in Berlin airlift. <laughs> and I missed that, I was not one mic. I had nothing to do with it. So anyway, after the, the uh, C-54 units, uh, I was, time out, let me get the notes. Uh, before leaving Guam, I'd like to uh, relate uh, the flying situation at that time. On one particular flight that I had, uh, we had been to Kwajalein to carry cargo and bring cargo back, switching cargo around. And on my return trip, I was briefed by the by our limited amount of, of uh, weather information we had. It was reported with one typhoon between me and Guam. Uh, anyway, we took on enough fuel we thought would be all right to get us through that, through that system. And of course, we were flying at 10,000. We were not pressurized aircraft at that time. So anyway, we headed back to Guam to a home station with knowing we had to go through one typhoon. Well, we got through it, all right. And our airspeed dropped off to 54 miles an hour because of strong, terrific winds out there, especially down at 10,000 feet. So we got through that one, and oh boy, we got it made. Well, we looked at a point of no return back to Kwajalein, and we'd already passed it. So we were uh, had to make one with what fuel we had. And we, uh, we said, okay, we got enough fuel. We did all the figures, and the engineer and I got together, and, we, and our navigator and said, oh, we can make it. Well, uh, shortly after that, I went down, we didn't run into another typhoon. It was on the way in. So we really began to sweat. And we did everything we knew to uh, get the most out of the airplane we could. And uh, we, nonetheless, uh, I found out later that my uh, my crew, my crew chief who does the servicing, well, he had put on a little more fuel than I had told him. And I, of course, was a little overweight on takeoff, which now I was happy he did that. He said, well, I got a little more fuel than you thought. <laughs> Now that, back in those days, we had to uh, depend on somebody to tell us our weight, and so it didn't make any difference. But luckily, with with these things going on, that luckily that crew chief threw a little extra fuel in, we made it. I made it, I think, I, I don't I don't remember how many gallons we had, but that was just one experience of, of flying uh, cargo around at that time. Now, I've been in cargo later, and I'll bring you up to date as I go along. So now I'm transferred back to the ZI, and I'm transferred uh, to uh, Texas, 
Kelly Air Force, a part of the Inspector General, U.S. Air Force Inspector General's office, and uh, at this point, this at this time, uh, uh, I was put on an inspection team to inspect the combat readiness of the B-29 units that were now the major bomber that we were using uh, as defense of the United States, and. Uh, uh, I was there, and uh, of course, as staff af aircraft, we had a, a B-25, and which I flew qualified in, flew and instructed in it. We had a, a, a C-47, this old DC-3, the Goonie Bird, everybody knows about it, and a C-46, and uh, one or two others at Kelly. But uh, everything was going along all right with my inspection team. We were inspecting uh, SAC, SAC units and, and uh, see if they were qualified or not and doing our job as inspectors for the Air Force. It was an Air Force Inspector General. And uh, it turned out that uh, during that period, a uh, Air Force General, uh, General Eubank, who had been uh, commanding the 14th Air Force in the Philippines, was moved into the I IG position and moved in, uh, and his serial number was 34A. Mine was 7553A, so you can figure uh, <laughs> I was uh, only a major at this time. And uh, anyhow, he moved in, and uh, so they assigned uh, a co-pilot for him. He was a pilot. I had Boku hours, and uh, uh, the first day he fired the first guy they gave him, and then they gave him another guy to fly as his co-pilot, and they fired, he fired him, so then guess who? They picked me to go in there and fly with him. Well, I don't, I think the first flight I had was a trip to Washington. So I got in there, and of course I was in the right seat, and he was the pilot, and I had done all the legwork and all the computations. I did all the, all the uh, radio work and everything. And he's a, he's a star general, and he had priority. And of course, all he had to do was sign his name. Well, that's all he did was sign his name. So I got along great with the old man and, and did well with him. And he was well pleased uh, that uh, he didn't like it because I am. Uh, he was about my age. Well, I'm older than he was now, but at that time he was losing his depth perception, which I'd lost. And uh, I would, uh, he would try to, he would be leveling off a little higher, and I'd have my leg against the, the stick trying to push it down. And uh, anyway, we made out, and I got promoted to a lieutenant colonel. <laughs> and he then got, he got uh, uh, orders to move. And uh, so did the inspector general's officer got moved. And he wanted to know if I went with him, wanted to go with him. I said, no, General, I, I, I'd like to pursue my career. Uh, I, didn't want, I didn't say I didn't want to be an aide, but I, I'd rather not. So he said, fine. And uh, so we were transferred to San Bernardino. So what, what time frame was this? Uh, 40s, late 40s? Uh, after leaving the Inspector General uh, in 52, then, uh, this was in January, September 52, uh, I was then uh, transferred uh, pipeline uh, and initially, in the, and this is July 1953, I was uh, transferred uh, to uh, 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 originally scheduled to go to Clark, and because I remember the IG and I had written General Myers a letter finding out that they were not going to send me to Clark, they had already uh, filled that position there and they didn't know where I was, so I, I wrote my friend General Myers and he, he wrote the Deputy Commander of PAC, PAC D, which is the Pacific Command for uh, uh, military airlift in the Pacific. I was on my route to, to Clark Field without an assignment. Clark and, Field is in the Philippines. In the Philippines. Mm -hmm. 
Well, as, as a result of the general's letter to the general, uh, he says, that seemed to me. So instead of going to Clark, I went to Hawaii. This was in 1953, in July 1953. So I went to Hawaii, and, uh, at, and in Hawaii at that time, uh, the assignment was the Military Airlift Command. And they had, uh, the Military Airlift Command at that time had uh, two, two air forces, the east, uh, eastern side and the western side. And the western side uh, was on Hawaii, and uh, uh, I can't remember the general's name, but he was a deputy commander of the uh, of the military airlift command. He was at a, uh, the head man was was a navy uh, admiral. I forget, I forget his name, but anyway, I was assigned to the Pac D headquarters, the Pacific Division. And I was put in plans, plans for the military airlift command, as well as because uh, the general who I was working for wore two hats. He was the Air Force commander of the units in supporting sink pack in the Pacific. Well, uh, because there were a difference of opinion after World War II, the uh, there was a fight between the Admiral and the Air Force General, and the Air Force General then didn't sign any forces at all to, to Pacific Division. And so we had, I was on the plan on two ways, once for the Military Airlift Command and the other one for SYNCPAC. We were getting all these plans for SYNCPAC, support plans. Well, we didn't have any forces. We couldn't. We couldn't make any plans. And so, with that problem, we uh, I sat down and wrote a letter and got the general to sign it to the uh, Pentagon, saying that we have no forces to support Sink Pack. You need to do something about it, which they did. They then authorized the Pacific Air Force, and they moved it out. And I was living in general quarters this time, even though I was a colonel. <laughs> but by, by the establishment of this Air Force headquarters, they, they took up all these nice quarters, so I had to, well, I, they let me stay in it until I, I transferred to the United States. So that's a, a, a guess about the services at that time, uh, because of the Air Force General Vandenberg, and I don't remember who the Sinkpack commander were, uh, at the end of World War II, they were across one another. So the, uh, all the uh, Army Air Corps uh, uh, was handled out of Japan uh, headquarters instead of SIGPAC. Well, then as a result of that, uh, they established a, an Air Force and they gave them uh, some, enough. They then uh, established uh, some supporting forces, Army Air Corps forces, uh, for, for SIGPAC. Well, then I was transferred then back to the States. Uh, that was in, uh, damn it. Okay, okay uh, so I was transferred back to the Zone of Interior in uh, July of 1956. And I was uh, transferred to Emory University as head of the ROTC program at Henry. In, in Atlanta. In Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, uh, they, prior to doing that, they sent me to a temporary duty to Maxwell to go through an instructor's training school as I was going to be the head of the professor of air science at Emory. Uh, I had to spend three months in gym and learn how to be a teacher in three months, if you can believe that. But anyway, I um, went through all that uh, at, uh, at Maxwell. Here again, Maxwell now has been converted into what they call the Air University for the Air Force. And uh, they had, uh, they conducted uh, uh, various schools there for student officers to train into their careers, more college and that type of thing for the Air Force. So, Anyway, I went to Emory 
and uh, became a staff member at Emory and uh, head of the ROTC. And we had uh, uh, a limited number of students at Emory at this time were not interested in military service. However, we had a, a Emory School at, at Oxford in Covington, Georgia. And we had a, a, a lot of people going uh, who spent the first two years at, instead of Emory, they, they spent it at Oxford. And these students in the ROTC program were very interested in it. But nonetheless, uh, we were unable to uh, graduate on, on, out of out of all the freshmen that would volunteer for the military at Emory as well as Oxford, we were only able to, uh, to interest around 15 or 20 students to become second lieutenants in the military. And so I recommended uh, to the Air Force headquarters in Maxwell, which was head of the training bit, that they, uh, they eliminated uh, Emory from training school, which after I left they did. Well, from that three years there was a tour, and the tour was uh, limited three years for this assignment. So then I was I was transferred to uh, back, back to Military Airlift Command in Dover, Delaware, and there they had the C-124 aircraft, which is uh, one of the big cargo carriers that have the clamshell doors that open up and trucks and vehicles can be loaded onto those. So that was the the DC uh, the C C124 that was being used at Dover. And so uh, I then with my flying experience and my background I was assigned as as commander of a C124 unit at Dover. And they sent me off to uh, to tinker for transitional training into this aircraft, uh, which I went through and graduated and came back. I had 90 days to upgrade or get or not be a commander of the, of the unit. So I completed that and became commander of the 124s. And uh, so uh, from now on out, and this I, I don't have references to my. My records that I have are not accurate, so I have to do it from memory, and my memory is not too good. <laughs> but anyway, I will say that um, I want to get um, suit Dover. I'm a lieutenant colonel. I'm a commander of the 124 unit, and one of the uh, and I don't know the exact date on this, but uh, long's come the Congo mission the Congo breakout and the United Nations getting involved with uh, troops and, uh, that went to the Congo. They were not American troops, but the United States agreed to furnish the transportation for these troops to move from, uh, from Europe down to the Congo to quiet the problems they were having in the Congo. And uh, we were the headquarters Scott Air Force then directed uh, uh, both the uh, East Coast Command and the West Coast Command to send these C-120, C-120, C-124s into Congo uh, for support of the troops, of the UN troops that were going to be coming from everywhere, from England, from France, from uh, Turkey, from uh, like if you read the paper you can find out who furnishes troops for the UN. So anyway, we were given the job of moving the troops. So uh, my boss, who was a colonel, I was a lieutenant colonel coming on the squad, and he was a group commander. So we took, uh, uh, we took about 25 C-124s en route over there to the Congo and supposedly the State Department had authorized us to operate out of the uh, Gold Coast state. Well, when we, uh, en route, we had, uh, out of our group, we had some uh, uh, 
30 some odd C-124s en route to there, and they said, you can't land here. You do not have landing rights. So our commander, which is a colonel, he's in the lead plane, he then told us we were all diverted to Chateau France, where we had an installation uh, authorized by the French government. So all our airplanes, were in, uh, including the one that's coming from McCord, uh, C-154, uh, uh, were there and there was around 60, 60 aircraft at Chateau when, when we all got there and had our maintenance and all that stuff we brought with us. And uh, <clears throat> so we started, to, our two colonels then were trying to work together and would get orders from the Pentagon to pick up these troops, take them there and do this. And we were having to uh, operate, instead of operating out of Africa, we were operating out of France. And that was a, a long distance from where you had to pick up to drop off to down to the Leopoldville in Congo. And uh, there were all kinds of problems, airplanes breaking down here and breaking down there. And these two colonels were trying to become generals. Uh, they, it was such a mess that the uh, general came over from Material Air Command, from the command, Military Air Air Command, and he looked at the, uh, looked at it and, and took them all, by, took both of them back. Well, and when he when he took them back. They looked up and I was a ranking lieutenant colonel, so I took over. And um, so this general and took them back and they said we were going to send them over to the election later. Well, later it didn't happen because, um, I, I don't know, I have some way of getting along with people. So we were able to get the, the groups together, start working together and organize different things. Uh, the first thing we did was we set up what we call a uh, a uh, a depot in one airplane. We gave them an, en an engine and we had everything they needed to go down to some of the airplanes that had broken down. They were all over Africa, and so we uh, uh, we organized about two of these planes, and they'd go down and give offload their aircraft and all their parts on the other aircraft, repair it, give the crew that, that airplane that's going with the mission. So with this worked out that we ironed out the problems that we were having uh, with what we called on maintenance mobile uh, transport aircraft. And it worked out fine. And uh, as a result of that, I got promoted to a colonel. <laughs> Luckily, the guy that did this was on the next Colonel, uh, colonel promotion, <laughs> and uh, just one of those lucky things I got promoted to colonel. Now, so anyway, when I got promoted to colonel, then I was transferred uh, to uh, the Pentagon. Why I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not a. A staff. Okay. We got changed. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd like to backtrack a little bit before going to the Pentagon. Uh, I was, uh, after returning from the Congo, uh, my, uh, I was transferred from the C-124s over to C-133 aircraft. This aircraft was built by Douglas, and it was the largest, it was, the airplane I think was built to haul the Atlas missile in. And uh, there are only 48 of them built. Uh, half of them were put on the East Coast and half of them on the West Coast. And they were having trouble. Uh, the airplanes were falling out of the sky and they don't, uh, after their, their first initial level of position, both on the East Coast and the West Coast, they were probably uh, uh, 70, 80 miles offshore, each one, one heading to, to Europe and one headed to Hawaii. And they were disappearing and they didn't know what was happening to them. They, were, they never found the aircraft, or of course, just disappeared off the scope. They were usually flying at the, at the, at the first level off speed, uh, uh, altitude was 10,000 feet, where they couldn't go any further because they had too much weight in the aircraft. The aircraft weighed 133,000. 
138,000 pounds at takeoff but carrying uh, fuel consumption from the East Coast to Europe was around 130,000 pounds of fuel. So you had to burn that fuel off before you could get above 10,000 feet. This aircraft was pressurized, but it had a, it, it vibrated. There's an awful lot of vibration in it. Anyway, we had, we had lost one or two, and so had the East Coast, and my commander had, has, had I was still a lieutenant colonel coming back from the Congo, and he transferred me over to the C-133 squadron, at, uh, which was the later aircraft than the C-124. And I got qualified in it and uh, flew it, and uh, we kept losing them just as they had before. And uh, the, the, they had done, the Air Force had done everything they could to find out what was causing these aircraft to disappear off the scope. Uh, then, as, uh, having uh, become squadron commander of the unit, uh, it was my feeling and my chief pilot's feeling that what was happening, the younger pilots were being brought up and put into these airplanes and told what to do and when to do it and didn't have that old-fashioned feel, uh, touch feel of the older pilots did. We think that most of them were younger pilots and uh, probably they, they may have been overweighted on takeoff, but back in those days, before we had automatic weighing machine and all this that modern aircraft have today, we had to trust the people who loaded the aircraft with the weight, which we call loadmasters. Anyway, we suspect that may have been happening, but wound up they finally had to take this aircraft. I was still flying it when I got promoted to a colonel in 1962. And uh, I was temporarily assigned to as uh, a deputy base commander, but that didn't last very long, because they moved me out as they normally do when they promote you to a colonel's position. I was transferred to, uh, to the Pentagon and to the Joint Staff, and I was assigned to J-4 in the Joint Staff back in 1962. And uh, uh, back in those days, uh, we uh, J J four was a supporting role to J three. In other words, we were the uh, uh, logistics airlift support uh, for the operation of J three. Uh, we would receive um, uh, plans uh, for support of. Uh, a pot of the war in Vietnam, and on uh, one occasion being uh, a colonel and, and responsible to General Myers, who was the J, J-4 commander, uh, we uh, would not sign off of J-3's uh, supporting role for the, for the airlift, for the possible airlift in, into Vietnam. and. Uh, it turned out we were right, but anyway, Vietnam came along, and as we all know, they, uh, they, uh, they had all kinds of problems in uh, Southeast Asia unloading. They had air, they had ships, and, air, and not as much as aircraft, uh, waiting offshore, couldn't find a place to offload the equipment as, as we escalated the war in the Vietnam. But anyway, one of my experiences I like to talk to you about, and while being part of the Joint Staff, uh, <clears throat> before the escalation that, that we went into with, uh, with, the, uh, with Vietnam, uh, uh, President Kennedy uh, wrote a, uh, requested the Joint Staff to go out and into the uh, to Vietnam to determine and advise him as what he should do about Vietnam. At that time, all we had was some army uh, and, uh, uh, advisors in Vietnam trying to train the Viet South Vietnam troops, and uh, so I was a member, a junior junior member. We had uh, three or four generals and captains and colonels. We went out to Vietnam 
and this happened to be the time of the crisis on the, that President Kennedy had uh, down in Cuba, and uh, we were unaware of that. Uh, we were out in, uh, on TDY. My wife and family were sitting at uh, in a house in Hawaii, Washington, worried about when they were going to get bombed or should she move south or get out of Washington. And I was unaware of that. I was in, I was over in Vietnam trying to advise the, the president of what he should do about escalating the war in Vietnam. So we had three services, and of course we had three different uh, recommended to the president, and I was was a member of the Air Force, and I agreed that uh, we should not escalate the war in Vietnam. And that was our recommendation to President Kennedy. Of course, uh, uh, our, uh, I was in the Pentagon when President Kennedy was killed. So, um, one of the jobs that I had in J-4, working for General Myers, who was the J-4, or commander of the Joint Staff was to uh, approve or disapprove airlift for the uh, UN forces that was needed by the UN. And as a result of that, I was uh, had to approve, uh, recommend to the Air Force, uh, or really a directive to the Air Force, to support uh, this mission or that mission, and so forth. As a result of that, uh, working with the United Nations uh, on the airlift part of it, I was just earlier, uh, I received a commendation from from them that I was real proud of, and I like to show it to you. This is a commendation that uh, I received as a result of working with the uh, with the people in the, over in the UN I don't know whether whether I can continue on or not but that was a uh, commendation I was proud of I was got the limited number of Medals, but it wasn't my fault. We were ordered to go wherever we were told to go. Okay. So uh, after serving, uh, after serving in the Pentagon, uh, at the Pentagon, you had a five-year tour uh, in the Pentagon, and then after that, you would turn back to your uh, original command. So I was returned. Then back to uh, uh, to Military Airlift Command on the East Coast, which was 21st Air Force Command, and uh, I spent two years there as, um, in the uh, in the staff uh, in the uh, staff of the command, and I retired after uh, in 1968, January 1968, with 28 years service. So, uh, that was quite a career. That was the end of my career. Can you tell us about, uh, just give us some, some idea about your family? I know you mentioned uh, your wife. And, uh, well, uh, yes, I can talk about my family and the family life. Uh, of course, in the military, as most people know, we move around quite frequently. I think I was moved around 28 times, and my wife, I think, was moved around, around 23 times. And she became, uh, as your wife should do, as I was, uh, when I was assigned to uh, Dover on my first command with uh, the C-124s, they were having a lot of problems, uh, uh, family problems. And uh, so my wife uh, uh, did a great thing of organizing women's get together and do this together and, and straighten out the uh, lives of the military people that were assigned to my squadron. And she did a great job and our squadron uh, was 
benefited by her services. Okay. And the difficulties they have uh, with moving, uh, I might relate one personal thing. Uh, when I was on Guam uh, after World War II, they had limited number of quarters, and they had uh, you had to have a two-year tour in Guam, or uh, uh, you could bring your wife over. Uh, and uh, but when I went over, it took you, you had a waiting list of 14 months. Well, if 14 months came around, uh, I decided to to extend bring the family over. So uh, the uh, uh, moving these here she is in Georgia uh, and Millie'sville, Georgia. She was school, uh, lived there, and uh, she had to truck these two two boys that were around 10 years old all the way across the country, get on a ship, and come to Guam. All of that uh, is difficult for a woman. But uh, bless her heart, she she did it, and is still doing it, and taking care of our children, I guess you say. But now we got great grandchildren we're worried about. But uh, life, uh, it's a satisfying life for me and my children. Both my two boys were in a draft age. When I was in Washington, they were both in college. And uh, they were going to Clemson because we used to go through Clemson uh, on the way to Washington from Georgia or, or Tennessee or Alabama. And uh, we liked Clemson, so we, did, we elected, they elected to go to Clemson. And uh, they, uh, we were in Washington, and my younger son, which was two years younger than my oldest boy, he was. Uh, uh, in uh, a freshman going to Clemson, my other son was a sophomore, a year ahead of him, and <coughs> they uh, uh, in the South, where we had come from, if you were going to college, you were exempt pretty much. There were other people that would be sent ahead of you, but all of a sudden, as a full colonel living in Washington in uh, Falls Church. Uh, there was a limited number of people. They had to meet certain quotas in the, uh, to fill the draft. And my son got a draft notice while he was while we were there to come in the army. And uh, so, uh, having been in military airlift command, I had still friends there. I said, "Well, what have you got down in Greenville that he can run down and sign up with reserve rather than being drafted?" And they, and it worked out. Uh, he went down and signed up and had to go off for military training at Kelly Field and uh, anyway was able to continue his education as a reserve, uh, mm -hmm. uh, well he was a private at the time. My, my other son was interested in aviation and he graduated from Clemson uh, as a second lieutenant and went into the Air Corps, uh, Air Force. And uh, he uh, graduated from flying school at Moody Air Force Base down in Valdosta. And uh, 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 two months after I had retired, so I went down and pinned the wings on him. And he went into the service and flew in Vietnam. And he has a story to tell about Vietnam. Okay. And I understand you have a daughter. Yeah, I'm a daughter. Yes, my daughter was born while we were in Hawaii. And uh, everybody in Hawaii is saying, well, you either have a fairy in Hawaii or you have a, a new new child. And I, my, my wife and I said, well, let, let, how about let's just try it for a girl, you know. So we tried for a girl and by golly, she was born in Hawaii. Uh, and, and it was a girl and she's a pet of the family. Now she's uh, She's got her daughter grown, Georgia fan, and uh, so is her daughter. And her daughter now has a child that's one year old, so we've got a great, I've got uh, three greats now. I think. Okay. 
Well, we're just about out of time here. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, making your contribution to this Veterans Oral History Project, and uh, thank you for your service also. Uh, any last comments or? or uh, no, I wish uh, the only f end comments I have. I'm so sad with the way our nation is is working, and we're not working together. We're a completely divided nation, and uh, I, it, it's, uh, I'm not a Democratic. I'm not uh, a Republican, but it's so sad to see our land so split politically. Yeah. Uh, God help us, that's all I can say. Okay. Well, again, thank you uh, for your contribution to the program.